Writing is awesome. It's easy to take it for granted, but if, for instance, I couldn't write my videos at first and had to basically improvise all my lines, it would basically look like Never mind the fact that, you know, barely any modern human civilization would exist. The most widely used writing system in the world these days, and in fact the one I'm using to write this video, is of course the Latin alphabet. But of course, the alphabet didn't just fall from the sky one day. It was developed over a long and winding history extending back to the dawn of writing itself, and that connects it with most of the other writing systems of the world today. So this is the Latin alphabet the English version of which contains 21 consonants and 5 vowels. Though of course if you get all the expansion packs, you can even get access to a whole bunch of new characters. Mostly just the regular characters with special markings, but still. Of course, if you look at it for long enough, you'll start to notice some weird peculiarities. For instance, why are all the vowels all randomly dispersed in the alphabet? Why do some letters make more than one sound? And also, what the hell's with letters like Q and X? What the hell's with that? To learn all about this, Let's go back in time about 5,000 years to when writing was first invented in the Middle East. Now, writing was technically invented multiple different times in different places, on account of there not being much of a good way to inform people who you don't even know exist about something that you just invented. Especially without a writing system. But our story takes us here for two of these instances that popped up around the same time. Egyptian hieroglyphs and Mesopotamian cuneiforms. By the 3rd millennium BC, the Nile and the Tigris and Euphrates river valleys had both become major centers of trade and civilization, with many of the world's first cities popping up around here. Cities, however, are huge, and they need to keep track of everything from finances to crop yields, which past a certain level can't be easily committed to human memory. I mean, sure, if you actively committed these things to memory, you could memorize how much food your house has in the fridge, and you can memorize how much money you have in your wallet. Oh. But can you do that on the scale of a whole neighborhood? Or a whole city-state? And can you remember what these amounts were at different time periods across different generations? Nope. This created the perfect market for special symbols pressed into a clay tablet to mark these things down. Now, the Latin alphabet is quite different from these systems, as it is what is known as an alphabet. Contrary to what at least I originally thought as a kid, an alphabet is not the collection of all the letters of a writing system, but actually a type of writing system in and of itself. Specifically one that has characters representing both consonants and vowels in more or less the same way. This is in contrast to, for example, Abu Gita's, which only do this for consonants, with vowels being treated more as special modifications to said consonants, or abjads that basically just write consonants, or syllabaries with characters representing both a consonant and a vowel in a sequence, or indeed what these writing systems were, which were logograms. A pictogram is basically a drawing or a picture of something meant to represent that literal thing. For instance, this drawing of a cow, which is meant to represent a cow. An ideogram is like a pictogram, but a bit less literal so that it can represent concepts related to the picture. For example, a drawing of the sun can either represent the actual star or planet orbits, or something the sun reminds us of, like summer or warm weather. A logogram, in turn, expands on this idea, with glyphs representing different ideas that could be related to the concept in the picture, or could look completely different. Just as long as everyone who will use this system knows that these markings or these wedges only refer to something specific. Now, Mesopotamian cuneiforms might have been the earliest writing system to come into existence, but it was in Egypt where the evolution of the Latin alphabet and many others first started. Ancient Egypt, as many of us already know, used a system of complex hieroglyphs, which were generally used either ideographically or logographically, but they could also be used phonetically as an abjad depending on the context. So basically, a particular glyph could either represent the things it's literally a picture of, some other vague concept that just needed a symbol, or just a sound making up a word, perhaps for something like foreign names. It was a complex and convoluted system that only a small fraction of the population could master, with well over 700 characters, meaning that being a scribe was actually a very exclusive class in ancient Egypt. This system nonetheless would evolve and simplify, first coming into the Levant as the proto sinaitic Abjad, and then up into modern-day Lebanon, where our story really ramps up. The Phoenicians were a Semitic people group who lived on the shores of what is now Lebanon, expert seafarers 
they crucially both had extensive trade links with Egypt and would also establish a massive trading post empire all across the ancient Mediterranean. And with steady trade links came not just goods, but ideas. The Phoenicians inherited the previous systems, but assigned their own names to some of the letters, pairing the first sounds in each of said names to whichever letter it was assigned to. Take this character of an ox for example. The Phoenician word for ox was Aleph, which started with a sound called a glottal stop, represented here by the apostrophe, with both the name and the initial sound now assigned to the character, which was simplified into this shape. This was the exact same story with Betz, Gimel, Dalet, He, Wow, Zain, Chetz, Tetz, Yod, Kap, Lamed, Mim, Nun, Samek, Ein, Pe, Sade, Kop. Oh, that's where we get the letter key from. Resh, Shin, and Tal. As you can see, these characters still kind of look like their original ideograms, but were simplified for use purely as the phonological building blocks of words. This was arguably the key to helping the writing system spread to other languages, as they could be molded into whatever word for whatever concept the situation demanded, at least as long as the language in question had a similar sound inventory to Phoenician. And when it came to learning of a new foreign concept, it was the difference between having to create a whole new logogram to represent it, versus learning what others called it and spelling it out accordingly. Phoenician was an abjad, and one that was written from right to left, which, as if the names of the letters weren't enough of a clue, would branch off to the east to form scripts including Hebrew, Arabic, Aramaic, Syriac, and many others, even going as far as India and Southeast Asia as the Brahmic scripts, including scripts like Devanagari and even Thai, but to the west, it would also branch off in a different way. One of the hot destinations on the phonetic Phoenicians' trade routes by the mid-first millennium BC was, of course, Greece, home to numerous different city-states with which the Phoenicians would establish contact. The Greeks had a writing system of their own back in the day, a syllabary entirely unrelated to the modern Greek script known as Linear B, or at least that's what we call it today, used by the Mycenaeans, but whose use had faded away shortly after the Late Bronze Age collapse. According to ancient Greek mythology, it was the Theban king Cadmus who first brought the Phoenician writing system to Greece. But however exactly it actually happened, the Greeks would adopt the Phoenician script for their language and dialects. It wasn't a perfect fit though, since Phoenician was an Afroasiatic Semitic language and Greek an Indo-European Hellenic language, meaning their phonologies were completely different especially in how the two languages treated vowels. Most of the letters upon adoption didn't change their sounds at all, but changed their look and names a bit, like Bet becoming Beta, Resh becoming Ro, Tau becoming Tau, etc. In the absence of a glottal stop, however, Alep became Alpha for the A ah sound, He and Chetz got similar treatments as well, as ancient Greek did have a H sound, but not two. So the harder Chetz became Eta, whose sound has since changed, and the softer he became epsilon. Ayn lost that other weird Semitic glottal sound and became omicron, and wow split up to become the now extinct digamma for the what sound, and the still extent upsilon for the u or u sound, with the Greeks finally adding out a few more letters of their own to even things out. One of the letters the Greeks added was chi, in most dialects pronounced as a ch or ch sound, but would also be paired with sigma to create the x digraph which in some dialects was simplified so that it was just the letter chi making those sounds. So that explains what's going on with X. It was here the writing direction started to change as well, slowly morphing from right to left to left to right, but in between using a system called boustrophedon. Boos meaning ox, strophe meaning to turn, and don in the manner of. Literally, turning in the manner of an ox meaning many in ancient Greece wrote in alternating directions in much the same manner as an ox plows a field. This would also explain how some of the letters got flipped over time, since the letters were also mirrored along with the sentences. For instance, if I were to write out the letter A, going left to right, I would write it out like this. But going right to left, I would write it out like this. Okay, bad example. Then the Greek script started to spread westward to the Romans. Except, not exactly. It did spread west into modern-day Italy, but not just to the Latin-speaking peoples in central Italy, but also to a long-lost group just to the north called the Etruscans, who would later influence said Latin-speaking peoples. A right-to-left script for a non-Indo-European language, the Old Italic script nonetheless helped set up the framework 
for the Latin alphabet as we know it today. Basically taking 21 of the letters of the Greek alphabet and yet again ever so slightly modifying their shapes. The Etruscans had a different phonology from Greek as well though, and so dropped certain letters including theta and phi, and also pronounced their version of gamma with more of a k sound, as their language didn't possess the voiced g sound. Which explains why Greek and all the older systems start off as A, B, G, and yet Latin starts off with A, B, C. This brings us to the Latin alphabet of the Romans, who in turn re-added some of those old sounds, pronouncing C as K or G, but adding a tail when it was G to avoid confusion, and assigning the F sound that Phi used to make to the old digamma that became F, delegating the task of making a W sound to V, before it ever made a V sound, a descendant of Ypsilon, which itself split up to create the letters V and Y. So that's the Latin alphabet, all 23 letters of it. Of course, V was actually pronounced with an U or a what sound depending on its place in a word, and there was no J digraph, so an I did the trick instead, but with its E or Y sounds. Which explains why Julius Caesar would have called himself Julius Caesar. The letters J, U, and W would be added after the fall of the Western Roman Empire, completing the basic 26 letters used across most of the languages which use the script. Though perhaps I should also address why we use two different writing systems. Uppercase and lowercase, anyone? I mean, think about it. Having some letters different from others for purely stylistic reasons is kind of a weird feature, and one that only really shows up in scripts related to Latin. Anyway, the Romans basically spent their whole history writing in caps lock rage, at least when it came to big, important texts. When it came to shorter texts that needed to be written quickly, however, a sort of cursive started to develop, almost as a kind of shorthand script. At the same time the Eastern Roman or Byzantine Empire was doing something similar with the Greek script, Latin cursive steadily evolved into Carolingian minuscule, and later the oso-stereotypical Germanic black letter font, and finally our modern lowercase. The two versions of the Latin script were at first used separately, with uppercase only being used for big important words, but slowly they started to intermingle, with scribes using the more prominent uppercase characters to mark important things like, for instance, the first letter of a sentence. The Latin alphabet had by now reached more or less its final form, but continued to diversify as it spread across Europe and around the world, incorporating new characters from other scripts, putting little markings on old characters, and solidifying the look of the letters with the printing press, and thus also changing their mind on some of the runic characters. Nowadays, the Latin alphabet is the official script in 131 sovereign states and co-official in 12 more now used by languages as unrelated to Latin as Hawaiian or Xhosa. Now, will we see further shifts in the alphabet in the future? It's hard to say in the age of the internet, with many believing that this might be the final form of the Latin alphabet that we'll be seeing. But I suppose that's a question for the Canubuses of the 31st century. As always, thanks for watching. As you might have already heard, I've shifted to a two-week schedule instead of a one-week schedule, so hopefully I was able to make this video more enjoyable than the ones I previously only spent one week on. If you did enjoy it, please be sure to like, check out the Patreon page, maybe even the merch store, and subscribe to learn something new every other Sunday. Yeah, I suppose we gotta work that one out.